Welcome to Living the New Life with Valentine Okeke. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So today we are going to continue from where we stopped. We've been talking about the fruit of the Spirit. And we are told in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23, that if the Holy Spirit controls your life, that is going to produce this kind of fruit in you. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control and we've been able to talk about joy and peace and today we are going to talk about a force of patience and in the series that we've been doing we'll try to look at the basic functions of this fruit when it's been cultivated then we also look on how you can cultivate it. Why we are using this approach is that when you know the function of something, it helps you to appreciate that thing. It becomes a motivator when you get to know the function. You will know immediately whether it's what you need, whether it's what you want or not. We are still going to use that same approach in dealing with the force of patience because patience is a force to be reckoned with. And um, how will you describe patience? In one of the translations, instead of patience, it calls it long-suffering. And the meaning of long-suffering is simply to suffer long. But I know that the modern day Christians, they don't like to hear the word suffering because they've been taught about confessing and receiving. No one believes in suffering any longer. But Christ said that if you must be his disciple, you must carry your cross and follow him. That means both suffering and responsibilities that are attached to serving him, you must be prepared to pay the price. In other words, what Christ is saying is that it's the price that is attached to walking with him. He said that every other thing, when you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he said every other thing that you need will be added to you including persecution. But the young preachers don't like talking about persecution because science has been able to give us a um, microwave and have your meal in two seconds. What is patience? It simply means to be able to stand up under pressure persecution, distress, trouble, you name it. I'll be using the two words interchangeably, patience and long-suffering. It simply means being able to stand up pressure, persecution, distress, trouble, and whatever you can think of that keeps you uncomfortable. You're being able to stand up those things. It produces endurance. The most important thing about the fruit of patience is that it produces endurance. And endurance, when it matures, produces strong character. And with strong character, you can withstand anything. Why am I saying this? 
We are living in troubled times. In times that people cannot make ends meet. And many, because of the lack of patience, had gotten into trouble. There is high rate of promiscuity in our land because of hardship. Many people are involved in all kinds of things that ordinarily, if our economic system were managed better, they wouldn't get involved in. But because of the lack of the fruit of patience in their lives, they are unable to withstand the difficulties that we're being forced to face, especially in our land. The economic downturn is all over the world, but I think in Africa, it's a peculiar case because of the kind of leadership that we have. We have people that are greedy, dishonest, selfish, wicked, you name it. Because of that, many families are subjected to untold hardship. And because of this hardship, many people have put their hands into unspeakable things. And that is why what we are sharing today is very important. We need to develop the fruit of patience. As a believer, the very moment you give your life to Christ, a tiny seed of patience is deposited in your life. But it is your responsibility to nurture it. It's your responsibility to develop it so that you will be able to build up strong character. Because without strong character, there is no way you will be able to stand up against the troubles and challenges that we are facing. I don't blame any person or anybody for getting involved in any kind of thing just to keep the body and soul together. But what I'm saying is that if only you will be able to develop the fruit of patience, you will find out that no matter the challenge that you're going through in life is just temporary. Nothing has the ability of staying permanently in a believer's life. And even in the challenge that you're going through, God said, I will not allow it to overwhelm you. I will show you the way of escape. Can you say hallelujah to that? There is always a way of escape. If only we will be patient enough. Too many young people have missed it in life, especially when it comes to the issue of choosing life partners because of impatience. Oh, they can't just hold on for the next one week, for the next one month, for the next six months, so that proper investigations and all the necessary things could be taken care of. In their haste, they get entangled into a relationship that is questionable, and at the end of the day, they will begin to blame themselves. That's why it's important to cultivate and develop this fruit. Patience produces endurance. And what is endurance? It's important that you take note of it. Endurance is the capacity to remain firm on the suffering without yielding to anger, resentment, despair, or self-pity. Endurance is the capacity to remain firm 
under suffering, without yielding to anger, resentment, despair, self-pity, grumbling, complaining. You will notice that an average individual in our land today complains a lot about the inability of the government to provide the basic needs of life, the inability of the government to provide security, the inability of the government to provide employment. You find people complaining. Why? They have simply not been able to cultivate and develop the fruit of patience. Let's quickly see what James had to say in James chapter 1. I'll read verses 2, 3, and 4. It says there, Dear brothers and sisters, whenever trouble comes your way, let it be an opportunity for joy. Why? Why should it be an opportunity for joy when trouble comes your way? Because at the end of it all, when God must have seen you through, you will have every opportunity to be grateful and be joyful. Verse 3, for when your faith is tested, when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. What does it mean when your faith is tested? It's simply saying, testing your faith means testing your depending on the promises of God. When you're holding on to the promises of God, it is only patience that will help you to obtain that that you're holding on to. Did you get it? When God must have made a promise to you, and you're holding on to that promise, a time in your life will come when that will be tested. For God to see whether you actually trust in him or you have your plan B. And too many times we have our plan B. And that plan B is never the best. If you are truly holding on to God's word, onto his promise, God expects you to cultivate and develop the fruit of patience because that is the only thing that will enable you to obtain that promise. Are you people getting the principle there? Believing the promise of God is one. That is faith. But for you to obtain that promise, it takes patience. And if you are not patient, you're going to produce Ishmael. Impatience produces Ishmael. You remember the story of Abraham. When he was 75 years old, God came to him and said, I'm going to bless you with a child. You have nothing to worry about. I'm going to make you the father of many nations. After 10 years, the wife said, I don't understand this deal that you have with God. You better take up that maid of mine. She's pretty, she's nice. Take her for a wife. And let's fulfill God's promise through Haggai. Of course, there is no way you can suggest that to any normal man. And he will begin to argue with you. That's one area no man will argue with you. So long as it's from the woman of the house. It was a very good idea. 
Remember, Abraham never went back to God to find out whether this suggestion is of him. Because this was to gratify his flesh. He went ahead with our plan. And they produced Ishmael. Fourteen years later, God appeared on the scene. Then Abraham was 99 years old. He said, by this time next year, your wife Sarah is going to have a son. Because my covenant with you will be established in Isaac. And it happened exactly the way God spoke. So it took 25 years before Abraham could obtain that promise. The only one that I know in the Bible that never fluttered with this arrangement was Caleb. When Moses promised him the hill, when he was 85 years old, he came to Joshua and said, Remember the promise that Moses gave to me 45 years ago. I am still as strong as when I was 40. So give me the hill, let me go and take it. And Joshua said, God be with you. And he was able to take the hill. Caleb had to wait for 45 solid years to be able to obtain that promise from God. Another person is in the person of Noah. Noah had to wait for 100 years to see the fulfillment of God's promise of wiping away the entire world with flood. So one thing is for you to know the promise. Another thing is for you to confess it. But the most important thing is for you to be patient enough to be able to obtain that promise. Is that okay? Hallelujah. We said that endurance is the capacity to remain firm under suffering without yielding to anger, resentment, despair, even unforgiveness. You notice that too many times because of impatience, we tend to become violent. There is so much violence in our land because of impatience. People cannot endure the hardship in the land any longer. And they take to kidnapping, they take to 419, they take to drugs, all in the bid to make ends meet. It's all because of lack of patience. The first function of the fruit of patience is to produce endurance. That is exactly what it does. Let's complete our reading of James chapter 1. It says there, dear brothers and sisters, whenever trouble comes your way, let it be an opportunity for joy. For when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Verse 4. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be strong in character and ready for anything. Have you seen it? When your endurance is fully developed, you will be what? Strong in character. The first function of the fruit of patience is to produce what? Endurance. And through endurance, you'll be able to have strong character. And with strong character, you'll be able to face anything that the enemy throws across your life. Let's quickly look at Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 1. We are seeing a lot of therefores. 
He said, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip of every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily hinders our progress. Did you notice something? He said, the sin. Why is it the sin? He's talking about the one that is unique to you, the one that is peculiar to you, your weak point, as it were. Yours might be talking too much. The other person's own might be flirting. You name it. It comes under the sin, the one that is peculiar to you. That bad habit, especially the sin, that particular one that is peculiar to you, that so easily hinders your progress. In other words, that particular sin that is peculiar to you, take note of it today that it is what hinders your progress in life. And let us run with endurance, have you seen it? The race that God has set before us. Before every believer, there is a race. And for you to be able to run this race, you must cultivate and develop the fruit of patience, which produces endurance. Without endurance, you will not be able to run the race that God has set before you. Later on, you should take time and read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 28. You will see a whole catalog of the things that Paul went through, the sufferings, the number of shipwrecks, the number of times he was given 39 lashes, and so on and so forth, the number of times he was stoned, the number of times he had shipwreck, you name it. But he was able to endure all these sufferings and trials just because of the crown of righteousness that was set before him. And at the close of his life, he wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. He said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. Have you seen the word race being used there? So before every believer, there is a race. He said, I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, that the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that great day of his return. There is a crown of righteousness that God has kept in stock for his children. But we must be able to finish the race. That means if you don't finish the race, there will be no prize for you. God will help us to finish the race. Amen. Later on, you can read up these following scriptures. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Matthew chapter 24, verse 13. Then Mark 13, 13. Then Luke chapter 21, verse 12. 16, 17 to 19. I think it's important. Let's look at that look. Look 21. Verse 12. It says there, but before all this occurs, there will be a time of great persecution, just like we are going through now. You will be dragged into synagogues and prisons, and you will be accused before kings and governors because you are my followers. Have you seen it? Yes, Verse 16. Even those closer to you, your parents, brothers, relatives, and friends will betray you. Is it happening now? Yes, 
And some of you will be killed. Is it happening now? They kill Christians every day in the land. And everyone will hate you because of your allegiance to me. But not a hair of your head will perish. By standing firm, you will win your souls. Have you seen it? We need to be able to stand firm. After you have done everything, you need to stand. And the only thing that will enable you to stand is endurance. And you cannot endure until you cultivate the fruit of patience. The first function of the fruit of patience is to produce endurance. The second function of the fruit of patience is to promote unity among believers. To promote unity among believers. Patience produces unity. That is the key thing. It's true we said among believers, but it also extends to families. It also extends to your workplace. It also extends to everything that consigns you that you have to relate with. So long as relationship is consigned with patience, you will be able to promote unity. Let's go to Colossians chapter 3 so that we can tie it up. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. It says there, since God chose you to be the holy people whom he loves, you must clothe yourself. The word clothe means it's something that you put on. That means that you have a choice either to put it on or not to put it on. Did you get it? Yes, but Paul is saying you must have to do this. And in verse 13, he will tell us why we must have to do that. You have a choice in the matter. But for our own benefit, let's see verse 13. He said, you must make allowance for each other's faults. Have you seen it there? And forgive the person who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. So the first step in promoting unity amongst believers, amongst members of your family, is to simply learn to overlook the faults of the other person. So please take note of it. That is the first step. The first step is to simply learn to overlook. That's in Colossians. Chapter 3, verse 13. He said is, there is no choice in it, in the real sense of it. Once you put on that clothing, the clothing of tender-heartedness. Okay? He called it here tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. For you to be forgiven you must make allowance to overlook. If you don't overlook, what it simply means is that you will not be able to forgive. Let me give you a formula now. When fault meet no patience, the result is unforgiveness. Fault minus patience it's equal to unforgiveness, bitterness, and strife. But when fault encounters patience, there is forgiveness 
mercy, and love. Did you get it? If you did not get anything, with this you can go home now. When you respect people's fault, there is every tendency that you will be able to forgive them of whatever mistake, of whatever shortcoming, you will be able to forgive it. Let's look at James chapter 5. The brother of Jesus, let's see what he has to say. Remember that during his lifetime, I mean Jesus' lifetime, his brothers never believed in him. <coughs> he says there in verse 7, Dear brothers and sisters, that's uh, James chapter 5, verse 7 to 9. He said, Dear brothers and sisters, you must be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. Consider the farmers who eagerly look for the rains in the fall and in the spring. They patiently wait for the precious harvest to ripen. You too must be patient and take courage, for the coming of the Lord is near. Verse 9. He said, don't grumble about each other, my brothers and sisters, or God will judge you. For look, the great judge is coming. He is standing at the door. How close is he? He's very, very close. But look at what I want you to see in verse 9. Don't grumble about each other. Do you know what produces grumbling? false because of their many inabilities an average Nigerian is grumbling and complaining once you, you say hello my friend how are you um, uh, no. I don't know Sha. this government overlook the mistakes of others if not you keep complaining when you see a wife complaining about a husband all the time, what is simply telling you is overlook that mistake, overlook that fault. Because if you don't, it says there that God will judge you. Have you seen the implication of grumbling? If you don't overlook, God will judge you. You know why? Because you have your own faults too. And once you say that this thing is a fault, and the fault must be judged. Fault is fault. There are no categories. So your own fault might not be my own, but it's still a fault. So he said, don't grumble about any fault, no matter the kind of fault. Just overlook it. Because if you don't, God is going to judge you. It happened to David. When he took Bathsheba and had an affair with her. When the prophet Nathan came and spoke in parables to him about the rich man that maltreated a poor man, David was annoyed. He said, whoever that did this, I swear by God, that man will not see tomorrow. I'm going to kill that person. That person is wicked. When he finished, the prophet smiled, he said, the man I'm talking about is you. I've given you wives, but this man fighting on your behalf in the war front had only one wife. You went and took the wife. That was not enough for you. You went ahead and killed the man. Oh, David was so sorrowful about that. He repented, God forgave him, but he said, because you have already judged this circumstance, I don't have any choice. You will be judged. The sword will never depart from your family. And what you did in secret, your own will be done in public. You all know the story what Absalom did in order to show the entire nation that he had taken over from the father. 
he had to use the father's uh, concubine openly. Are you following? But when you judge any weakness in the life of anybody, you open up yourself for judgment in your own area of weakness. Let's look at Matthew chapter 18. I just want to drive this point home, okay? Verse 23. We'll read from verse 23 to 30. He says the for this reason, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. Verse 24. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so the king ordered that he and his wife, his children, and everything he had be sold to pay the debt. But the man fell down before the king and begged him and said, Oh, sir, be patient with me, and I will pay it all. Verse 27. Then the king was filled with pity for him, and he released him and forgave him his debt. Is that in your Bible? Verse 28. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars, but he was owing millions of dollars. He grabbed him by the throat, and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged him for a little more time. Be patient and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested, jailed until the debt could be paid in full. Have you seen it? When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him what had happened. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgive you all that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison until he had paid every penny. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters in your heart. Have you seen it? Anywhere? Yeah. Why was this specified? Because you can forgive people in your mind. <laughs> and how do you know the difference between forgiving somebody in your mind and in your heart? What's the difference? How do you know that you are forgiving somebody from your heart? You know the acid test? Whatever you have forgiven, you must forget. But so long as you can recall that and use that same occasion, remembering it all the, any other time the person offends you, that's how the other time you did so and so to me. That forgiveness is from your mind. It's not from your heart. If it's from your heart, you will never recall it. If it's from your heart, it's like when you bury somebody. Do you go and assume what you have buried? Why? Because when you do, it will be stinking. So you don't assume. You allow what you buried to remain there. Now you know the difference between forgiving people from your heart and from your mind. Anytime you recall that thing that they did to you and you feel a degree of remorse or anger or self-pity or resentment towards that person, know that your forgiveness had not gone full circle. It's still in the area of your mind. You need to take it to your heart. And the only way you take it to your heart <laughs> is for you not to remember. You must forgive and forget. Oh, this topic is sweet and delicate. But are you enjoying yourself? I'm trying to set you free so that you can be happy all the days of your life, okay? 
Just forget about what people do to you. Allow God to be the one that will handle them, okay? But so long as you keep remembering what was done to you five, ten, six, seven years ago, then you're going to have issues. And too many times, you know why God said forgive? Because even the people you're holding things against, they don't even remember. They have moved on. And you're still building up that negative emotion. And that negative emotion has the ability of eating you up. That's why God said, let it go. Don't allow people to have a portion of your heart. Don't allow them to have a portion of your time and mind. Is that okay? Romans chapter 15. I'll begin to read from verse 5. He said, may God, who gives this patience and encouragement, help you live in complete harmony with each other. Have you seen it? Who gives the patience? Patience comes from God. How does it come from God? We are told in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, when the Holy Spirit controls your life, he will produce this kind of fruit in you. Love, joy, peace, patience, you name it. Is that okay? What we are talking about comes from God. God gives his children patience and encouragement. And you see, when you have patience, you will be able to live in complete harmony with one another. Have you seen it? That's where I'm going, actually. May God, who gives this patience and encouragement, help you live in complete harmony with each other. It didn't say in harmony with each other. Complete. With patience, you will be able to live with complete harmony with each other. And he continued, each with the attitude of Christ Jesus towards the other. What is the attitude of Christ? Is the attitude of love. Then all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 7. So accept each other, just as Christ has accepted you. The secret is to accept one another. To accept means that you have been able to overlook if you are not able to overlook one another's fault, you will never be able to accept. That is the key. Are you following? So our ambition should be to accept one another. Accepting does not mean that the person you are accepting does not have any fault. No human being is perfect. But when you make up your mind to obey this order, this command, to accept one another, that means that you are committed to overlooking one another's fault. For you to be an overcomer in life, you must learn to forgive those that disagree and quarrel with you. Please take note of that. Is that okay? We've been talking about the functions of the fruit of patience. And I said that patience is a force. The third function of the fruit of patience is to enable a believer to obtain the promises contained in the Word of God. Patience enables a believer to obtain the promises contained in the word of God. You know, earlier on we've talked about Abraham. Am I right? Let's quickly go to Hebrews chapter 6. Verse 12 to 15. It says there, Then... You will not become spiritually dull and indifferent 
Instead, you will follow the example of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and patience. Have you seen it? For you to be able to inherit God's promises, you must cultivate the fruit of patience. Verse 13, for example, there was God's promise to Abraham. Since there was no one greater to swear by, God took an oath in his own name, saying, I will certainly bless you richly, and I will multiply your descendants into countless millions. Then Abraham waited patiently, and he received what God had promised him. Have you seen it? But you know, along the line, he actually waited for 10 years. By the 11th year, Sarah came up with uh, mounted pressure on him. You all know the story now. And after he had Ishmael, he still had to wait for another 14 years. By the time he was 99 years, God appeared to him and said, Don't worry, I know the promise I made to you. By this time next year, you're going to have a son in whom I'm going to confirm my covenant. Having done all that you need to do, you must learn to stand. If you read Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 14, then Hebrew chapter 10, verse 36. In summary, in this function... Time is not a consideration in your prayer. I want you to take note of it. Time is not a consideration in your prayer. Your responsibility is to pray. The manifesting of the answers that you need to your prayer is God's sole responsibility. He doesn't share it with anybody. And that's why my dad in those days would say God's time is the best. I didn't understand what he was talking about. Our responsibility as his children is to pray. God's responsibility is to decide when he knows the best time. He knows the perfect solution to every prayer. And he knows exactly when to manifest the solution for maximum benefit. If you do anything otherwise, what will you produce? Let me see whether you guys are sensitive. You will produce Ishmael. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, we are told there that God is faithful to perform his promises. God will never say anything that he will not do. To obtain his promises, you must believe and stand on his word. If you want to obtain his promises, you must first of all believe. Then number two, you must stand. Standing means you must be patient. You must stand on his word. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 12. I've already told you the story of Caleb. You can find that in Joshua chapter 14 verse 10. Then of course that of Noah. You can find in uh, Genesis chapter 5. Verse 32, then chapter 7, verse 6. The promises of God is for all believers. They are claimed by those with faith, but they are obtained by those with patience. Did you see another principle there? The promises of God are for who? They are for all believers. They are claimed by those with what? But they are obtained by those with patience. Have you seen the difference? You can claim it, but claiming it is not sufficient. To claim it, you can trust God, 
with his promises. But with the fruit of patience, you will be able to obtain it. For you to be able to obtain the promise of God, you must cultivate and develop the fruit of patience. In Igbo language, they put it this way. What it means is that it is only that person that is patient that can eat. They, they said the, the patient dog is the fattest bone. But in Igbo language, they say, if you're, if you're patient, you will be able to eat the fish that you catch with the hook. Because you see, when you throw down that hook, you have to wait patiently and make sure that you don't move anyhow because once you move, the fish will run away. So you must have to lower down the hook and stay quietly, quietly, no movement, so that nothing will scare the fish. They will now come. But if you are impatient, after one minute you move. As you move, the fish will also move. It takes patience for you to be able to fish with the hook. That's what he's saying. And like the other adage says, the patient dog is the fattest bull. Did you get something this evening? In summary, for this function, the promises of God belongs to all believers. They are claimed by those that have faith, but they are obtained by those that are patient. You must be patient for you to be able to receive the promises of God. And you know, like I said earlier on, impatience has cost a lot of people their destiny. Because to every promise of God, there is a timing to it. And that's why prophecy is a dangerous thing. When a prophecy goes over your head and you lack the fruit of patience, there is every tendency that you run ahead of God's timing. And when you do, you're going to meet with disaster. Are you following? What do you do? You must cultivate and develop the fruit of patience. Can we all stand? Thank you for listening to today's broadcast. You can join us in worship every Sunday by 9 a.m. for World Feast. Venue is at the 7 Option Parks, Ladoke Akintola Boulevard, 